Hey everybody, welcome to lesson number 13. It's the last lesson in this Bible study series on prayer. This has been a topical Bible study, so we've been all over Scripture from one week to the next. Today we're going to be in the letter of 1 John chapter 5. You will need your Bible or your Bible app open to 1 John chapter 5. There is also a listening guide for this lesson. You'll find it the same place you found this video. Just scroll down and click on that link, download that PDF, and then print it out. There are some uh, blanks there for you to fill out during the teaching portion of the lesson. And as always, some discussion questions there for you and your small group to go through together afterwards. Before we jump into the lesson today, let's pray together, shall we? Father in heaven, we are grateful. Uh, we're grateful for uh, an entire season spent just thinking about prayer and seeing what your word has to say to us about prayer. You've been good to us to, um, to open our hearts and our minds to what you have to teach us on, on this subject. And our prayer is that you'll finish uh, in that same way today, Lord, that uh, even as we open your word, you will open our hearts, that you'll pour into us, you'll help us to better understand this topic of prayer to, to that you'll change how we see ourselves and how we see you and how we see the world around us. Uh, our prayer, Lord, is that you'll help us to become the people you've called us to become. And so we love you and we love your word and we love its place in our lives. And we pray all of this in Jesus name. Amen. Praying with confidence is what we're talking about today uh, in this series where every week we're thinking about prayer as a central spiritual discipline to the Christian walk. Uh, and over the last couple of weeks, we had a prayer on Jesus's, I mean, a lesson on Jesus's model prayer a couple of weeks ago, uh, the Luke version of Jesus's model prayer. And then last week, we looked at uh, what it what it feels like, what it looks like, what it sounds like to pray for a nation or a people's a group, uh, whatever that group is. Maybe it's the church generally. Uh, but we looked at that uh, in last week's lesson. Today we're going to be talking about praying with confidence. And we are in 1 John chapter 5. Uh, the Apostle John uh, wrote five of our New Testament books, right? He wrote his gospel, the gospel of John. He wrote uh, the Revelation, and then he wrote three uh, short letters that we have, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Uh, he was one of the apostles and part of Jesus's inner circle, so to speak, Peter, James, and John. These are the three that Jesus leaned in the most to, took with him up on the Mount of Transfiguration. They got to witness him in his glory there. Uh, he is the brother of James, so one of the sons of thunder, uh, and he referred to himself in his own gospel often as the, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Uh, verse John seems to have been written uh, specifically, these letters seem to have been written specifically to correct some misinformation in the early church. Uh, people were denying, for example, that Jesus was the Messiah or denying that uh, Jesus was God, that he de denying his divinity. Uh, chapter 4 of 1 John is one of also one of the stronger sections uh, of Scripture on the subject of our love for each other as believers. Uh, when we think about how we are to treat one another and how we are to engage one another and be with one another and be in community with each other, 1 John chapter 4 is a go-to chapter in that regard. Uh, but as we get into chapter 5, he begins chapter 5 with a, a compelling argument for our having faith in Jesus as the Son of God. Uh, and so that's really where he's, he's focused by the time he gets to chapter 5. Our passage today then, at the conclusion of those remarks, our passage today begins to wrap up uh, the letter of 1 John, his concluding remarks. And it begins with verse, our passage, our lesson begins with verse 14, but let's go back to verse 13 just to get it all in context. Now there is some debate among scholars about whether verse 13 belongs with the previous paragraph or with the paragraph we're going to be studying. We're going to treat it as if it belongs to the paragraph we're going to be studying, so we will treat this as kind of his concluding remarks beginning with verse 13. Here's what it sounds like. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, 
that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. So that is our entire passage. We will, we will be focusing the entire lesson today on primarily verses 14 and 15. But he begins this conclu these concluding remarks in verse 13 uh, similarly to the way he begins his concluding remarks in his gospel, this statement of assurance that you may know that you have eternal life. In the early church, anyway, this assurance had become critical because there were all of these questions floating around about did Jesus really die and if he did really die was he really resurrected and was he really the son of God and was he really the Messiah all of these questions were floating around and and needed assurance around them that's what he's providing here uh, he the early church pretty much unanimously believed that Jesus would return at any moment back then. They were living day to day feeling like Jesus was going to come back. He said he would come back. He said he would return. And they were living day to day thinking it could be any moment now. It could be any time. They certainly were not expecting that it would be years of waiting, and they absolutely would not have expected that it would be over 2,000 years waiting for him to return. So this assurance was really critical for the early church. Christ followers at that time, uh, they had their own needs for that assurance, but we also have needs for assurance, right? Even in our time, even 2,000 years later, we still have needs. We still uh, experience intellectual doubt in how we understand Jesus and who we understand him to be. Uh, maybe life throws a curveball at us and suddenly our future is very unclear, right? And so doubts begin to creep in. Maybe our expectations of God have been dashed and we don't really even know what we believe now. And doubt begins to creep in. We need assurances. Maybe we find ourselves in relationships or in communities who are asking hard questions about our faith and we don't have the answers to those questions, and so doubt begins to creep in. All of us experience doubt, and all of us are in need of assurance. And what John has written to us in 1 John is so that we can have that assurance. He writes to all of us in Scripture to give us some assurance that following Christ is the right direction for us. By the way, as I mentioned earlier, it is the same way he ends his gospel, his own gospel. In John chapter 20, verse 30, he says, The disciples saw Jesus do many other miraculous signs in addition to the ones recorded in this book. But these are written, here it is, so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. Doubt has always been with us and we need assurances and what John is seeking to do in his writings is provide us with those assurances. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the first statement on your listening guide. For the Christ follower, one of the purposes of Scripture is to provide us with some assurances in the face of all the doubts this life and this world throw at us. While the world continues to be wrong over and over again, the truth of Scripture has stood the test of time. So Scripture provides us with the, the very kinds of assurances that we are needing. Look again, though, uh, at our passage then, beginning in verse 14, and let's see what it says. Verse 14, And this is the confidence that we have toward Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. So in light of this assurance that John is providing for us, in light of this assurance, we likewise have a confidence that we can come to God in prayer and that he will hear our prayer, right? Note, the confidence here is not tied to anything in us. It's not about just bearing up and, 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 and strengthening ourselves and pulling ourselves up by our own bootstraps so that we can have confidence. It's not some kind of pretense on our part. It's not really even an attitude adjustment on our part that we do in ourselves. It's not something in ourselves at all. 
uh, there's not a there, there is not confidence that if we choose the right words right or shout loudly or not enough or, or we pray long enough that this will somehow manipulate God into hearing us that's not what's going on here this is not that kind of a confidence at all rather the confidence that John is talking about is tied to our saving relationship with Jesus it's referenced in verse 13 right in light of this, I want to give this so that you'll have assurance in that relationship. And in that relationship, then you will have confidence that your prayers are being heard. The focus here, the focus is on our relationship with Him. We don't wonder, for example, if, if, if you've ever been married before, you don't, you don't wake up from time to time and think, I wonder if I'm really married. I wonder if I really am in relationship with this person. If you have a best friend in your life, you don't ever stop and ask yourself, I wonder if we really are in relationship with one another or not. Of course we are. You know you are. That's an experiential reality. And that is what John is directing us to, to find our confidence in terms of God hearing our prayers is we find our confidence in that relationship that we have with Christ. We all have intellectual doubts from time to time. What John is helping us know here is how to navigate those doubts. The key, the focus, should be on the relationship. That's where we, that's where we are able to navigate through doubts. One of the primary causes of this um, thing in, in our culture today that we're referring to as deconstruction is that when we've been taught to focus on religion more than on a relationship with Christ, when our religion then becomes challenged, when the traditions of our religion or when the culture of our religion becomes challenged, we move to a different place. Uh, we, we, we leave our, the, the home of our youth and we go away to a college campus and all of a sudden the traditions and the culture of our faith or begin to be challenged by what we experience there, then deconstruction is that process uh, that, that, that we refer to. And what John is saying to us here is the assurance that we're looking for is in the relationship. It's in the relationship with Christ, not in the trappings of our religion. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the second statement on your listening guide. Intellectual doubts about our faith are a normal part of being human. The way forward through those doubts is to focus on our relationship with Christ rather than on the trappings of our religion. So that relationship becomes the anchor that we hold on to. So look again at the key to this confidence at verse 14, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. Let's focus on that. What is that saying to us? We've touched on this idea at several points. Uh, throughout this study, throughout these 13 weeks together, there have been many times when we've come back to this idea of, of praying the will of God, understanding the will of God, according to the will of God, praying in the name of Jesus and according with the nature and the purposes of Jesus. Now, that's what brings us confidence. When we know that we are praying God's will, then we can have confidence that He's hearing us and that He's going to bring it about. It reminds me of Jesus' prayer in Gethsemane in Matthew chapter 26, verse 39. It says, He went on a little farther and bowed with His face to the ground, praying, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me, yet I want Your will to be done, not my will. That Gethsemane prayer is a prayer that we can always pray with great confidence because it is the very act of surrender that God has called all of us to. Your will, not mine. Also in Jesus' description of His ecclesia, of His church in Matthew chapter 18, uh, He says it again, verse 19, He says again, Truly, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by My Father in heaven. For where two or three gather, here it is again, in my name, there am I with them. Uh, so we can never have more confidence in our praying than when within our relationship with Christ, we are asking Him to do His own will. We're asking Him to make it so, to, to move forward with His own plan and His own will in our life, in the lives of those around us, and in this world. That's where confidence comes from. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the next statement on your listening guide. 
The more time we spend in communion with God, the deeper our walk with Him, and the better we come to understand His will. This is the source of our confidence when we pray. Our confidence, though, is not only knowing that He hears us. That's part of the confidence that we have, but there's more. Look at what it says in verse 15. And if we know that He hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of Him. In other words, we know that He is already about answering the very things that we've asked Him to do. Uh, Knowing that He hears us is kind of that first level of confidence, but when we pray according to His will, then we have a much deeper level of confidence that He's actually going to complete His will, that He's actually going to do what we're praying for Him to do. Uh, Jesus' brother, uh, James, uh, in his writings, Pastor James, he was the, the lead pastor of the church in Jerusalem. And in his book that he gave us, in his writing, the book of James in the New Testament, here's the way he says it in James chapter 1, verse 5. If you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. He will not rebu- rebuke you for asking. But when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver. For a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they're unstable in everything that they do. So check your faith in God and pray according to His will. This is not asking, I mean, th- th- what we're talking about here is not about asking God for whatever we want. Hey, God, I'd like a new car. Hey, God, I want a different job. Hey, God, uh, I want a, 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 a better girlfriend or a better boyfriend. Or No, it, it's not asking about asking God for whatever we want. This whole premise is based, is, 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 the premise of all of this is that we are asking God for His own will. That is our heart attitude. That is the heart that we are bringing before God. These are the things that I want, God, but at the end of all of this, I want what you want more than I want what I want. Make it so. So it's about growing in our faith so that more and more as we pray, we are asking God for what He wants for us. We're, we're more and more in tune with and in touch with what God wants for us, and that's what we're praying. And in that sense, then, confidence is merely an outgrowth of our faith, of our understanding of who God is. Uh, the writer of Hebrews in chapter 1 says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. That's the description of faith. It is confidence and assurance uh, in, in what we do not see. And so this confidence then is not some kind of a shallow name it, claim it, prosperity gospel. God wants me to have anything I want. If I just ask, I'll get it. That's a very shallow understanding of what this confidence is about. Um, it's not some kind of a magical formula for getting what I want. God is some kind of a dispenser of blessings, uh, like some, some kind of a, 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 a machine that we just go and put our quarter in and, and ask for what we want. Rather, the confidence we're talking about here is a quiet confidence that comes from sitting long with God and deepening our understanding of who He is and what He does of Him and His ways. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the last statement on your listening guide. Confidence in prayer is not a confidence that I can persuade God to give me what I want. It is a humble, quiet confidence that comes from a growing faith and a deepening understanding of who God is and what He wants for me. That's where this confidence comes from. So, Summarizing, what are my takeaways? What, are, what, have I, what, what have I taken away from this passage in terms of what it teaches us about praying in confidence? Number one, in a world of chaos and confusion, Scripture provides the very assurance that we're looking for. It's the only source of truth that we can really depend upon. Number two, the way forward through intellectual doubts about faith is to focus on our relationship with Christ. That's where our anchor is. That's what we should be anchored to, our relationship with Christ. Number three, the best source of confidence in prayer is time spent with God. And number four, confidence in prayer comes from a growing faith and a deepening 
understanding of God. Those are my takeaways from this passage. I have loved this study with you guys. I'm glad you've taken this journey with me. It's been a really rich study for me. I hope it has been for you as well. We're going to start a whole new series next week, and so I hope that you'll come with me on that journey as well. I love you guys. In the meantime, have a great week. We'll see you in the next study.